I want to welcome all of you here to the Rosenmeyer Forum. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with this forum, uh, it is named in honor of the late Gordon Rosenmeyer, Senator from Little Falls and Brainerd, representing Crow Wing and Morrison counties. He is regarded as the single most influential, powerful, and respected legislator in all of Minnesota history. I deem it a high honor to introduce to you today a, gr a greatly respected scholar on foreign policy and who is no stranger to Central Lakes College and our Rosenmeyer forums. Mr. Tom Hansen is a former U.S. Foreign Policy Service Officer with the United States State Department in Washington, D.C. His diplomatic tours of duty include the Soviet Union, France, Norway, Sweden, and the former East Germany and the former Soviet Republic of Georgia. Mr. Hansen also worked on the staffs of both the United States Senate and United States House of Representatives Foreign Relations Committee. Tom Hansen is also currently the diplomat in residence at the University of Minnesota Duluth and also has taught diplomacy at Carleton College in Minnesota. He also serves as the chair of the Minnesota Committee on Foreign Relations. With no further ado, it is my distinct privilege to introduce to you today Mr. Tom Hansen. Well, thank you, Steve, so much. And uh, thanks for coming out today. Uh, my understanding is, you know, you all have students here have class uh, at once, so we'll go until about 12.50. I'll try to leave time for questions maybe the last 10 minutes or so uh, as we go through this. There's a lot going on in the world right now. Uh, you know, we've just, we just come out of our 2022 midterm elections. Uh, two years into the Biden administration, we have a good sense now of what their policies are. And um, it's, a, uh, it's a very um, tricky period of history. The, the British, every year, come up with a, a term, the, the word of the year. And uh, this year, just, it was just announced last month, uh, the word for this year is permacrisis. Um, of course, the Brits are having a very hard time themselves and maybe are exaggerating a bit. But a lot of um, commentators and governments are saying that the next 10 years are going to be crucial. That's what our government is saying. That is what the Chinese are saying that the way things are shifting around globally, in terms of the economy, in terms of COVID, in terms of uh, relations between the great powers, the next 10 years are gonna be crucial. So I wanna take a step back. I mean, we are in this period now, this kind of um, rather intense period in global history. And I, I, I find myself wanting to kind of look back and say, okay, now really, where are we as a country now? In our history too, and how should we be charting our way? And how are we charting our way in this new situation? So if you'll bear with me, um, as I thought about it, you know, we, our country really started uh, fully in 1789. Uh, you know, we adopted our, our constitution, we the people. This is the beginning of the first American century, 1789 exactly. And that century was marked by early presidents who were focused on developing our great continent here. Um, peace and commerce, honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. The idea being that we should get our own system, our own system of governments in order as a model for the rest of the world. And that was the best way we could help other countries. All of our early presidents had that point of view. And of course, the other uh, really hallmark of our first century was the Monroe Doctrine, which we basically said to other powers, stay out of our region, not just our immediate periphery, but out of the Americas. And uh, this was successful. The British Navy uh, was uh, very important in assuring that. But um, our first century really developed along these lines and culminated exactly 100 years later, uh, 1889, is the year when the United States became the largest economy in the world. So our first century culminated with our emergence as a number one uh, global economy. We've, we've been that ever since. 
And of course, China now is moving to perhaps challenge that. Uh, you know, we celebrated that event with the Columbia. Is this, is this moving forward? Hmm. Okay. Let me try something here. It's so it's, things are moving forward on my on my computer, but not on the screen. Just let me sort of start from the beginning here. Sorry about this. Kind of unusual. Just one second. Okay. That's 1789. <laughs> just to backtrack for just a moment. Um, this is, of course, uh, uh, Jefferson's admonition. Uh, early in the century. The Monroe Doctrine uh, was, I say, the centerpiece of our foreign policy. The Columbia Exposition in 1889 marked our emergence. And so the second American century got underway with a whole different approach. Our presidents, uh, in the start of our second century, were much more willing to go out into the world. Um, I, I find this campaign poster from the 1900 election uh, very revelatory. You know, the American flag has not been planted in foreign soil to acquire more territory, but for humanity's sake. And that's really been I kind of the American outlook uh, all through this period. Um, in mid-century, 1941, uh, Henry Luce uh, famously wrote an article about the American century, and the 20th century uh, really came to be an American century, because we started off number one economically, and by the end of the century, we were number one uh, in terms of power. Um, the Yalta Conference at the end of World War II sort of enshrined our role. Um, and exactly 100 years later, 1989, the Berlin Wall falls. And that's the end of our second century. So 1789, 1889, 1989. And we're exactly one third of the way now into our third century. Second century was the American century. What will this century be, and how should we be conducting ourselves? Now, I think one of the hallmarks of this first third of the uh, 20th, 20, our third century, rather, has been, of course, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, what we called a unipolar world for a time, and the expansion of NATO, which probably is the main political, uh, along with the rise of China, um, event of, of this first third of the century. And as Joe Biden says, uh, the 21st century will also be the American century. And uh, this is a very ambitious outlook. It's the outlook, I think, of most of the establishment in Washington. And so I think it's important to, um, a as we consider this as, the, as, as sort of the American outlook, uh, to look at some data points uh, that have arisen now, um, actually some of them just in the last month or two, um, which kind of take a look at where the world is at this point. Now, just one second again. Please bear with me. These, uh, for some reason, this is not functioning quite right. Hmm. Just one second. I think I'm going to try to come into this again one more time. Okay, slideshow from the beginning. All right. It's a recap. It's always good to have a recap, right? Okay, 21st century. Now, we face a different situation than we did during the Cold War with the Soviet Union or during the early years of our third century because there are challenges arising. We see it most clearly with the rise of China and Russia. They're increasingly in contact with each other. Uh, each of them considers Ukraine and Taiwan essential to their uh, security on their periphery, and we are challenging them on both fronts. Uh, and there are four countries that really are the main uh, potential adversaries for the United States. Uh, three of them are already nuclear powers. One of them uh, may be about to become a nuclear power. And these four countries, China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran, are increasingly cooperating with each other 
and linking up. Uh, so this is a, a major challenge for, for the U.S. Uh, and so how we navigate this is key. So as I say, in October, a number of data points came out. One of them was the, uh, the latest U.N. world population projections, which were quite interesting this year. Um, the world's population is heading to about 10.5 billion by the end of this century. In the lifetime of the students who are here, this will all be transpiring. Um, we just passed eight. Literally, in these, in these months, we just passed eight billion. And there are major shifts going on. As you see, uh, India comes to replace China as the number one uh, largest country. Here you can see 1990, 2022, and then looking ahead to 2050. <clears throat> I mean, if you look at India's growth, <clears throat> they basically double uh, to 2050. China's coming down because of its one-child policy. Uh, a number of countries are declining rapidly in population. Um, here's a list of some of these countries who, by 2100, will lose that percent of their population. The lowest birth rate ever recorded since they started tracking this was recorded last year in South Korea, 0.84. Um, at this rate, as you can see here, they're, they're, they'll be losing between 60, 50 and 60 percent of the population if this continues. Um, uh, at that at that pace, the West is declining. Uh, the populations of Europe are declining as well, and I think that this graph really says a lot about this third American century. Um, as you can see, uh, Asia, Africa is coming up to be about 40 percent of the human population by the end of this century. Which I mean, this is. It's, it's going to be so much the story of this, of this century. And between Asia and Africa, you've got about 85 percent of humanity. The West, uh, the United States um, and Europe, will fall to under 10 percent of humanity. Uh, these are stark statistics. And um, this is being used right now by China and Russia actively in their propaganda toward what we call the Global South, Latin America, Africa, most of Asia, saying, basically, who are these people? Who, who are these 10 percent, 10 percenters, to tell the rest of us what to do, especially since they represent all of the former colonial powers uh, of the past? Um, the G7 is basically the European powers plus Japan which is seen as a colonial uh, legacy power in Asia. So these population statistics uh, greatly complicate um, our, uh, our policy um, and sort of the prospects um, for, uh, for the future. And as I say, Africa uh, will be increasingly important. If we look at another data point, uh, COP27 took place uh, just last month. Uh, Partly because of Ukraine, uh, a lot of countries are going back to coal and to, uh, and to uh, fossil fuels, at least temporarily, as we meet this crisis. So COP27 was pretty much seen as a failure uh, in terms of getting at the, uh, the global problems. And if nothing is done, these are the parts of the world that are going to suffer most. Um, this is where the temperature will be rising the fastest in this third American century. And as you can see, Africa, which will be growing the fastest, coming to have the largest population on the planet, is the most severely impacted by climate. Um, you can see the other regions of the world. In, in the U.S., it's sort of the southwest. Um, this map, I, other maps I've seen show that central China also will be having climate issues, right where a lot of their population lives. And they already had the hottest spell uh, ever recorded in China this summer in, in that central Chinese plain. So as I say, what happens in these parts of the world uh, and the way the climate crisis is playing into this will be essential. Um, and it will be a challenge for U.S. foreign policy as well. We're going to have to focus on issues like this uh, as they emerge. We're already seeing it with the food crisis that has arisen. It was developing even before COVID, but with the Ukraine crisis, uh, Ukrainian and Russian grains not getting to market, 
there's tremendous food inflation. Um, and this chart shows uh, the share of the population that is experiencing food insecurity uh, right now, you know, coming up to January. And you can see which countries, uh, you know, our, Som our Somali uh, fellow citizens are really, uh, you know, concerned about their country back home that they came from, and, and a lot of the people have family there. There's a tremendous famine uh, developing in Somalia, in the Horn of Africa, South Sudan being the worst. But as you can see, once again, a lot of these issues will be gravitating and coalescing in that part of the world. And as I mentioned, because of Ukraine, uh, it, there's a move back toward coal um, and toward uh, fossil fuels again. Uh, and this was one of the uh, sort of sad uh, conclusions at the COP27 conference. Now, another data point is our own census. What's happening? That's what's happening to the world population, what's happening to the U.S. population. And uh, more and more sort of graphs and charts about this last 2020 census are coming out. Here you can see the basic, I guess, the basic reality of our country right now. These are the areas where the uh, where population has shifted. In, in dark blue, it's the largest growth areas. Uh, and then as you go down toward red, these are the areas that are losing population. And it's interesting that uh, it's 2% per year. So there are some parts of the country that are growing fast. The fastest growing urban area in the United States in the last cen uh, uh, census was a place called The Villages. The Villages is a retirement community in, in Florida. Uh, it's, it, you know, the, the title of the census this year was 50 States of Gray, not 50 Shades of Gray, 50 States of Gray, because the U.S. population is aging. And uh, the fact that The Villages is sort of emblematic uh, of this growth uh, is, uh, is, I think, indicative. The U.S. population grew at its lowest rate since 1930. For the first time, under 18s declined in absolute numbers. It's never happened before that the youngest part of the population um, has declined. Here you can see, um, this is from the last census, so this is very current now. Uh, currently, uh, Adults on the right, adults over 18, here you see the ethnic breakdown of American adults over 18. On the left, Americans under 18. And as you can see, there's some basic, basic shifts going on. Um, the Hispanic population will be a larger part. The white population will be clearly a minority. The multiracial group is increasing. Um, and so this is one of the kind of main shifts that's going on uh, in our country. The other one, which is rather sad to report, is that we have a falling life expectancy in our country. We're the only developed country to report statistics like this, um, where for every age group, the population in the last census uh, declined. The biggest drop since the 1920s. I mean, we know the, re I mean, COVID plays into this. I'm sure the opioid crisis does as well. Um, and certain groups have been even more impacted than others. I think one of the saddest statistics from the census is that indigenous Americans, the American Indian population, in the past 10 years saw its life expectancy decline by 6.6 years in one decade which is a catastrophic statistic when you think about it. And here you see, um, there, sort of year by year, that, that's all of us. There we all are in the last cent. Uh, there's still some greatest generation folks hanging on. Um, silent generation, the boomers. What's interesting is that ordinarily, the, the newest generation would have the highest numbers. And that's not true of Gen X they actually have lower numbers. Um, in, the 19, in the 2000 census, the number of under 18s in the US grew by 9 million. In the 2010 census, it grew by 2 million. In this 
uh, census, it went down by 1.1 million, the number of under-18s. In 1960, the under-18s made up 36 percent of the American population in 1960. Today, it's 22 percent and falling. So we are becoming an older uh, nation, uh, for better or worse. Now, moving now to kind of on the basis of some of these realities, what U.S. policy uh, is and, and should be, perhaps, uh, I think a really good place to start is the national security strategy of the United States, which Biden came out with finally. Once again, a recent data point. This is from October 2022. So how are we navigating this world? What, what, how do we see it? What are the challenges? What should we be doing? Well, this, and here we see uh, uh, Biden and Tony Blinken at a, at a summit of democracy last year. Uh, the administration is framing this era now in terms of autocracy versus democracy. That's the framing device for the United States right now, that we are in an existential um, competition, confrontation even, with autocratic systems. Um, and so the national security strategy underlines this. And it says that the, the, the most consequential threat to the United States geopolitical challenge are countries like China, Russia, autocracies that are trying to reshape the international order that we created in our American century, last century, uh, to our disadvantage. And so the number one goal is to stand up to that. But at the same time, it says another existential goal is to uh, work against the climate threat, which it describes as an existential threat. And it calls for cooperating with China on the climate threat. A lot of observers have labeled this strategy schizophrenic. It's like we have two goals that don't really come together. Are we challenging, confronting China, or are we cooperating with them? There's a very interesting section in this. The way we try to square the circle right now, there's a sentence in this, um, in this uh, strategy that says, no country should withhold progress on existential transnational issues like climate just because of bilateral differences. Problem is, other countries don't buy that. And so the Chinese say, look, we either have a good relationship or we don't. And because of Taiwan policy, they've stopped all cooperation on climate. Total cessation of discussion of climate. Um, now, that may start to change a little bit at the, uh, at COP20, at uh, the G20 meeting, which I'll talk about in a minute. There was some talk about maybe resuming. But the basic contradiction is there. Which way is it? Because the geopolitical issues right now are getting in the way of addressing the climate and other existential pandemics, existential issues. We see that most clearly with Ukraine, where because of sanctions and because of what Russia did, we're going back to coal. Um, and so this, th this contradiction is built in. Now, another very interesting part of our national security strategy, um, and I think this reflects kind of the Democrats, they said that actually the biggest threat to the U.S., even bigger than China, is our own internal situation. It's our polarization. And even more important, and this is, like I said, this is sketched out as an existential security threat to the U.S., our inequality. This recent chart uh, from the Congressional Bu Budget Office shows that the top 10 percent of our fellow citizens control a little over 20, 75 percent of all the wealth. The next group um, controls maybe, what, 20 percent? And look at the bottom. That, that is, you almost can't see it on the chart. That's the bottom 50 percent of Americans, the bottom half of our population is along the, and almost starting to disappear at the bottom of the chart, maybe with 1 percent of the wealth. Our national security strategy says that is the threat. Well, then the question is, what do we do about it? And how do we, is it China? Is it climate? Is it this? 
and which one do we prioritize, which one do we work around. So what policies should we be developing now to meet all of this? This is the Situation Room. This is a recent uh, photo. This is in the White House. Well, actually, it's uh, in, the, in the Eisenhower Building next to the White House. But this is where they meet uh, to make the big decisions. You can see Kamala Harris there uh, on Biden's right, Tony Blinken, Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense. Uh, you can see Janet Yellen discussing what is to be done. Now, in Washington, there is a term that everyone uses now. It started in the military, but now everybody uses it. It's called DIME, D-I-M-E. And what that means is you've got some tools for your foreign policy. Diplomacy is different from foreign policy. You've got diplomatic tools. You've got informational, and uh, this would also include intelligence tools, military, and then economic, DIME. And so in a nutshell, what we have been doing for a long time, and even more now, with this administration is we're focusing on economic, we're focusing on sanctions. And as Tom Pickering, who's the head of the American Academy of Diplomacy, uh, has pointed out, uh, pretty much we are stepping back from diplomacy and relying on economic sanctions. Uh, short of putting boots on the ground, which we were doing after 9-11, we learned we don't want to do that anymore too much. So we're using sanctions. Um, you know, I, for students who are here, you know, there's a great need right now for good people to go into diplomacy, to the various aspects of diplomacy, State Department, UN, um, all aspects, USAID, that's the aid organization. Uh, the State Department is offering internships now, paid internships uh, that you can apply to for the summer, uh, trying to encourage your generation to get more involved, because I firmly believe that as we go forward in this third century, diplomacy will have to come back and take center stage. It's not happening yet, but it will have to happen at some point. Now, the, um, uh, the use of sanctions goes way back. It's been a tool for America, a privileged tool, really since World War I. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, having seen the slaughter of the First World War, in setting up, helping to set up the League of Nations, um, got everyone to agree to make sanctions a center tool. As, as, uh, as, as Wilson said, sanctions are something more tremendous than war. Uh, another quote is, he said, sanctions are a tool that brings a nation uh, to its senses, just as suffocation removes from the individual all inclination to fight. So just pressure countries economically, and they will, they will bend. Um, now, it hasn't much turned out that way. Some of the some, uh, scholars who have studied sanctions in the, uh, after, the, after Wilson in the, in, the tw in the 20th century uh, concluded that out of 19 attempts that were studied, only three were successful. Uh, and one of those was the case where we put tremendous sanctions on Great Britain, our ally, to get them out of Suez. We completely throttled their economy in 1956 to force them to leave Suez. So actually, one of the times when sanctions worked was when it was with our, our, our friend uh, rather than, than enemies. So sanctions are a tricky business. Um, the longer they're in place, the harder they are to remove. They often will try to play the populations against the leaders. In other words, economic sanctions cause individual citizens to suffer and then they put pressure on their governments. Uh, it doesn't often happen that way, but sometimes it does. Uh, but this can lead to unintended results and tragic results. So for example, our sanctions against Iraq after the first Gulf War, so in the early 1990s, are estimated to have led to the death of 500,000 children in Iraq. And this became a big issue when Madeleine Albright uh, went on 60 Minutes and was asked about this by Leslie Stahl, citing this 500,000 figure, asking if it was worth it, and Madeleine said, yes, it was worth it. Well, that led to a firestorm, and it led the UN to adapt a new law in the mid-'90s. Food shall never be used as a political tool, nor hunger as a weapon. It is now against UN law 
to do what we did um, in Iraq. And then finally, the United States itself, uh, some years later in 2000, changed our legislation, uh, the Trade Sanctions Reform Act, uh, saying that we can no longer use these kind of tools uh, to basically cause a population to suffer that way. That is why nowadays our, our sanctions are most often directed at the leaders. You notice that, it's, that, that, that they're, they're, they're kind of more focused than they used to be, but they still hurt the population, there's no question. And in most cases, the populations rally around the leadership anyway. In fact, aut autocracies often use sanctions to justify what they're doing, saying the problems in our country are caused not by the fact that we're, our government is the way it is, but, but because of these sanctions. And the other aspect is this, that um, sanctions should always be linked to uh, diplomacy. Uh, because if they're not, nations, this is a quote from a recent analysis, nations are at their most dangerous when they perceive an existential threat or an injustice from which there's no political relief through diplomacy. In other words, if you just put sanctions on a country and then just say, okay, let, let them stew and don't negotiate, uh, this can happen. Uh, it was U.S. sanctions against Japan in the late 30s where we cut them off from oil and resources that most scholars and historians now say basically tipped Japan toward attacking Pearl Harbor, which was a suicidal thing for them to have done, but it was, so the U.S. financial siege of Japan before Pearl Harbor. So sanctions are a very tricky tool, and it's the tool that we are using uh, above all else. Um, as Ben Stale from the, um, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations uh, said not long ago, he said, sanctions are like overusing an antibiotic. If they're overprescribed, uh, it mutates into a resistant strain. So here you see um, sanctions, our sanctions building up uh, over the years. Russia more and more uh, implicated here since uh, the invasion. So we put tremendous sanctions on Russia. Uh, they're the most sanctioned country in the world now. Um, Vladimir Putin is not backing down, though. Um, he's finding workarounds, unfortunately. Uh, the ruble has strengthened. Um, they're, they're managing to sell their oil somehow. Um, and of course, we all know the tragic, tragic situation that's evolving there. Um, Russia basically, I think, plans to keep this slice of Ukraine where most of the agriculture is, uh, a lot of the industry, and of course, the essential Black Sea ports that they need. Um, and so it's going to be very hard to dislodge them from there, I'm afraid, even though. The Ukrainians have taken care of so on, and the Russians now are, are engaging in, uh, in, in, in bombing of infrastructure, as we all know, just trying to basically wreck Ukraine uh, and force, they're again, they're trying to force the population to suffer so much that, and so it's a, it's a very um, nasty, terrible policy that they're following. But we are not, get, we are saying that we're going to support Ukraine to the hilt, and um, Ukraine can come into NATO, which is what this is all about and we're doubling down. Um, and the problem is both sides are fighting to the last Ukrainian. That's what's happening, which is a tragic thing to see. Now, I'm gonna quickly go through some of the current sanctions, because I say this is the main tool that we're using. So Janet Yellen has rolled out uh, a lot of sanctions against Russia, against transport of their energy. Um, Russia's responded by cutting back on natural gas. Here you can see how dependent uh, the uh, European countries are on Russian national, natural gas, and so this is beginning to really bite um, uh, in the European Union. Much more, we, they are feeling the effects of these sanctions more than we are. And of course, when this mysterious explosion took place in the North Stream pipeline uh, a month or two ago, uh, no one still knows who did that. It's still very much, I mean, there are all kinds of wild rumors about what it was. Um, a lot of people think it was Russia, some people think it was Poland, uh, who knows? But. Um, it's worsened the situation. So the Europeans are beginning to uh, feel the strain, and they're beginning to not break, break ranks, but they're, they're starting to complain to us um, about the situation. This is, the, uh, this is Bruno Le Maire, the French finance minister, who said recently, the Ukraine crisis could lead to American economic domination of Europe as the US profits to the detriment of Europe. It is true that we are going to be 
exporting a lot of liquefied natural gas out of Texas. We're going to make money hand over fist, uh, replacing Russian oil and gas. Um, and so the Europeans now are accusing us of gouging. They say that we're charging them four to five times more for this liquefied natural gas than we charge in the U.S. Um, and so there's a lot of complaining going on right now. Um, we say, well, it's not us. It's the middlemen. It's the banks that are coming in between and ratcheting up the price. So, but it's a big disagreement, shall we say. Meanwhile, though, the, the situation with energy and food inflation is driving up uh, inflation, especially now in the global south, this, this part of humanity which will be dominant uh, in this new century. And it's interesting to see that here are, the, here are the countries that have joined forces to sanction Russia. And you can see it's basically, as I said, the old European former uh, colonial powers plus Japan, right here Australia. The global south is not going along with us. Uh, Washington is trying to rectify this. A lot of people in the global south, for example, this is the head of the African Union, Macky Sall, who is saying that uh, this, all these problems are resulting from Western sanctions, all this inflation, all this disruption, uh, not from the Russian invasion. And we are sending our diplomats all around the world to say, no, this is Russia's fault. It's not our fault. Uh, so far, we're losing uh, that narrative. And people like Sell or um, Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa are noting how our media, if you go to CNN, right from February 24th, the beginning of the crisis, there were endless stories about the individual suffering of Ukrainians. I mean, just human interest. And they say, well, why was none of that done for Yemen or for the Palestinians or for, in other words, they're saying this is racism that this is a European issue, and it's an example of white racism, the whole Ukraine situation. As I say, we, we've, we've got a, a ways to come back now in terms of our diplomacy to convince people uh, on this score. Now, really quickly, the other aspect of our sanctions has to do with the Russian uh, uh, National Bank. We have frozen half of their, uh, of their uh, assets, which are parked in Western uh, institutions, $325 billion is, has been just taken and frozen. We may use it to rebuild Ukraine, which would set a, a, an amazing precedent because as, um, as, as a lot of uh, economic experts, the IMF says that with these sanctions, the dollar will now diminish and the world economic system will, frank, will, will fraction. Credit Suisse calls this the death of the Bretton Woods system. In other words, in this analysis, we have overplayed our hand on sanctions in a way that's going to undermine the dollar, which is what allows us to do the sanctions in the first place, the central role of the dollar. Um, this is all still developing. Um, we'll see where this goes. But China has announced it's going to come out with a digital currency. It's working on it very hard. They've banned all crypto in China. No private crypto allowed. It's all in the hands of the government. And they're going to have a, a currency, which they hope will be a, a global currency at, at a certain point. These are the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, one of the most important alliances right now in the world, um, meeting just last month to talk about the Chinese yuan becoming an alternative global reserve. These are big countries that are moving toward uh, some kind of cooperation on an alternative to the dollar. China is in the pro have you may have noticed that gold prices are going up right now. It's because China is buying up gold all around the world. They're, they want to have a digital currency linked to commodities, to gold and other things. And so they're starting to buy all this up. Where this goes, nobody knows. Um, I think in Washington, the feeling is not to be worried because of Tina. Tina is there is no alternative. This is a this was coined by Margaret Thatcher when she did her reforms. And the idea was, you, you, know, you have to do it this way. There's no other way to do this. So really quickly, because we're running out of time, I'll just say that the other aspect of this is we're going after China on tech. So we are trying to block their access to semiconductors. And we're asking all of our allies to go along with us. I'm going to zip through this here. Um, uh, it's a central committee. So but semiconductors are the whole deal. 
the architect of this policy to try to throttle China's high-tech industry is Jake Sullivan. Jake is from Minnesota. He went to Southwest High School. Uh, he's the head of the National Security Council, and he is heading this up. As you can see, we, we kind of got out of the semiconductor game after 1990. You can see now uh, TSMC makes 95 percent of the world's most sophisticated trip, uh, chips. One company in Taiwan. We signed something called the Chips and Science Act, which is going to give all kinds of incentives for uh, people to relocate here away from China, not to have to do with China. Will our allies go along? They have such huge markets in China. We're especially worried about quantum. These two guys are the greatest quantum minds in the world, apparently, um, Wei Jinping and, and his, his, his assistant. Uh, we want to stop them in their tracks, because all of these high-tech uh, things have military implications. So it's a security thing. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I mean, the G20 showed a little bit of progress, but um, just by way of concluding, the sanctions have been our choice, our choice uh, tool. They're having mixed results in this new American century. And given the challenges I showed at the beginning, um, it's going to be up to us and up to your generation to think hard, really hard, about how we, how we make our way in this third century. I'll stop there, and I hope we have a time for a question or two. Questions? Yeah. That went kind of fast, and you might be sort of spinning, but uh, yeah. Yes. Sorry, I fell. Um, you spoke a little bit about China trying to create a crypto system, Yes. I think. Yes. Um, so speaking of crypto and crypto mining, so last year China prohibited, uh, they banned like the domestic crypto mining? Yes, they did, yes. Do you think it would be smart for Americans to start crypto mining in the U.S.? Hmm. Should Americans start crypto mining? That, that, that's, so the crypto mining has gravitated to other parts of the world now. I think there is some crypto mining going on in our country, I think, but a lot of it is, is other parts of Asia now. Uh, some African countries. The problem with crypto mining is it's really hard on the environment. It, it's very extractive. And uh, a lot of people want crypto mining banned just for that reason. Um, crypto, you know, we're going to have to decide what to do. Um, you know, the, the, the Sam Bankman Freed scandal at FTX and, uh, and the way the whole crypto industry right now is, is, is rocking. Um, it's a a lot of people think that crypto does not have a future because it can be used uh, for money laundering. Uh, there's no there there. It's not linked to anything. Um, as I, you know, the Chinese want to link their crypto to something concrete. Um, so I kind of think that the trend is going to be toward national digital currencies and away from, you know, in the 19th century, America had a lot of what they call wildcat currencies, right, before the dollar really stabilized. There was a greenback dollar and all kinds of stuff. And I see crypto almost in that it, it's, it's a new technology. There are some people who say that the government is letting it go because it's a way to, 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 to follow who are some of the bad actors in the kind of mafia world out there, who all of whom are using crypto uh, uh, in, in their activities. So I don't know. And, and, and if, we, if we do have then a national, eventually have a national uh, cryptocurrency, you know, we'll have to do some mining then uh, ourselves. So that's a long answer. But China, everyone was really taken aback when China, from one day to the next, banned all this activity because they were the number one source of crypto mining up until then. Any further, further question or thought or? I don't think I need a mic, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm wondering about the prices of uh, the gas that's coming from the United States and going to Europe. Yeah. Who sets that price, and is there no control over not being able to gouge the EU and the other countries that want to, uh, to get that product? You know, we're saying that this is a free market, and, and there's a lot of demand. There's a lack of supply and tremendous demand now uh, as countries are scrambling to replace Russian, Russian resources. So that's our first, first response, is that it's the market. As I said, our second response is that, that, and I guess the way LNG transport works, banks do get involved at some point. They, 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 take, they, they sort of insure the assets, 
they, they're responsible for it as it leaves the U.S. And that's where the price gouging is going. Shell had record profits last year, for example, beyond anything they've ever had. Uh, and so we are saying, oh, it's because of, of them. The problem with the whole issue is that it's very inexpensive to transport liquefied natural gas by pipeline. It's probably four to five times cheaper than by sea because if you're using a pipeline, it arrives at the port and can be immediately trans transformed uh, um, in into use. Whereas if you're shipping, it comes from fracking grounds. So fracking is going to increase exponentially in the U.S. now because of this, exponentially. And <clears throat> so the, the, it goes onto ships, but when it arrives, it has to be liquefied. So you have to build liquefaction facilities, which they're doing now in Europe, really large um, uh, facilities where you take this oil as it comes off the ship and you transform it into a usable form. Um, it's much more expensive, much more expensive. Right there from the get-go, it's more expensive. So Europe, um, without Russia, has no land-based access to these resources. They'll be getting it from Qatar, from um, maybe a little bit from Norway, uh, but not much, and then mainly from us. This, as I say, Ted Cruz is in hog heaven right now. He has been trying to get the Europeans to move away from Russian uh, liquefied natural gas for years. In fact, in the first year of Biden's administration, he put a block on all ambassador early appointments. Ted Cruz did. No ambassadors got through until we sanctioned Germany to stop using Russian LNG. And the Ukraine crisis now has allowed this to happen naturally. So, uh, yeah, a lot of things are in flux, a lot of new economic realities, and it's a test to our allies. It's going to be a real test for them. Uh, on this energy thing. And then what we're asking them to do toward China on tech, uh, South Korea, the Europeans, are going to take tremendous losses uh, if they comply with our sanctions against Chinese tech, because they're all making money in China. Um, and they're already saying we can't. In fact, Japan said officially, we can't do this. Don't ask us to do this. And we're saying you have to do this because it's autocracy versus democracy. And, that, and sanctions are the tool. Yeah. Well, um, we never hear your explanation in terms of, of how the cost goes up. So, you know, the amount of percentage that it goes up from what it's sold for here. Yeah. And what it is, you know, being sold for in Europe. Yep. So, why is there not more information available about that? And why isn't that put out to the American public? Mm. Well, that raises two very important, point, very important points. First of all, I don't know whether you've noticed, but there's a lot of things that don't get reported in American media, and especially these kind of international issues. There's just a lot that's glossed over. Maybe, they, maybe they, our outlets feel the Americans aren't really interested, and that may be true. There's only a few. Uh, but that's the one thing. Um, and the other is that, you know, free markets. So the, the idea, well, yeah, okay, the, the Europeans really want this, and there's not enough of it, we have it, and so whatever the market will bear, right, which is a kind of a cynical way of looking at it. Um, as I said, just the transport itself is more expensive, so right from the beginning it's going to be more expensive. But as I say, this is part of a larger situation that's developing where on a lot of fronts we're asking our allies in Asia and Europe to sacrifice a lot for our policy while we are not sacrificing much, in fact, we're benefiting to a fairly large degree economically from a lot of what's going on. Another example of this is the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I think I can show you. Uh, uh, so, so you, you in, in, in addition to the Chips and Science Act, you've got the Inflation um, Reduction Act, where we're going to get incentives 
for all kinds of production, um, electric cars, for example, to create jobs, to make us more self-sufficient. Um, for the Europeans, this is protectionism because they, they are not getting these subsidies. So the Europeans are threatening a trade war over the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, I showed the chart of our inequality. The Biden administration wants, by any means possible, to bring production, create jobs, bring all this back to the U.S., which is, which is laudable. But it's at the expense, once again, of our allies, uh, both in Asia and in, and in Europe. Like I say, they're, they're threatening a trade war. They're, they're threatening to respond with a similar kind of incentives for their own and freeze us out of their markets. So all this is, frankly, this is all just taking shape the last couple of weeks. And you'll be reading more and more about this. Uh, Macron was in Washington to try to discuss some of this just a day or two ago, but it didn't, it didn't go anywhere. Um, so, I mean, we'll see. And uh, where the really big losses are, um, are going to be on, on the semiconductors. I've got a couple of, uh, somewhere here, I've got, I've got some statistics. Uh, the Boston Consulting Group uh, says that the U.S. Uh, um, sort of computer industry will lose at least 37 uh, percent of its, of its revenues w under these new policies. Jake Sullivan has said that our export controls are intended to help the U.S. maintain as large a lead as possible over rivals. But that means over everybody, not just China and Russia. Um, I, I, some of my friends in Washington are watching this claim that in the administration right now there are three groups vying for Biden's ear. There's the cooperationists who think we got to get back to trying to have a win-win situation with China, but they're in a tiny minority. There are the centrists who want a careful approach on these issues. And then there's the restrictionist hardliners who are for decoupling. And, and that's Jake Sullivan, for example. And this group is by far in the majority, in fact, in both parties. Um, so we'll see. I mean, our sanctions are aimed at, uh, at reinforcing our own economy, decoupling from China, and, and pressuring our allies to go along with these policies. And we shall see. We'll see how this goes. Yes? I just want to comment. I listen to the BBC every night. Yep. And so I get a little bit more global perspective. Good for you. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and you know, yes, and so because what Biden is trying to do right now with the sanctions focus is to get our allies to make long-term commitments, literally to restructure the way they operate in their economy with large countries like China. This is not just like a little thing. This is like pulling back permanently. And the problem is what happens in the U.S. two years from now? Um, you know, I think we are seeing, because we've been going, we're so polarized going back and forth, that a lot of countries do see us as, uh, as somewhat unpredictable. Biden said in his, actually in his inaugural address, or first address to Congress um, after he was elected, he said, when I go around and talk to world leaders, Biden said, I always hear the same thing. And that is, we're glad that you're back. You know, because that's been the whole Biden mantra, we're back. You know? So we're glad you're back, but for how long? And Biden said, I hear that everywhere I go. Um, and that's an issue. That's an issue. I mean, who knows what we'll have in 2024. Um, yeah. So, yep, I mean, the, this, 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 these are complicating factors. Absolutely. I mean, put your finger on it. Yeah. Well, oh, there's one more question down in the front. Yeah. How is Brexit affecting the UK and its relationship with both the United States Good question. Well, Brexit is causing the Brits to coin a term like permacrisis uh, to describe the world. I mean, they, they, Britain's having a very hard time. As you, I mean, the whole Liz Truss phenomenon where she, I don't know if you saw this, but they, um, they, they, they had a competition in Britain between Liz Truss and a head of cabbage. <laughs> Who would last longer? And the cabbage lasted longer. <laughs> you know, she was out like in, in, in two weeks. But, um, 
No, they, they've, so they're, actually a lot of Brits are beginning, just beginning to rethink some of this because the Brexit disruption, you know, you add COVID to that, you add Ukraine, you add all these things. Britain hoped that, that they'd be able to become global Britain. In other words, free of, so the Tories, the main thing that they are worried about is the restrictions, the EU restrictions on business, right? The Tories want to have a very deregulated environment and they want the city of London to be very deregulated, like, like Singapore, right? So they figured, okay, we pull out of the EU, we get free of all these socialist or whatever, German, French restrictions, then we go global and we start signing deals with all these, we'll have a big trade deal with America, we'll have a bilaterally. And that's proving to be more difficult than they thought. And the problem with the Biden administration is a lot of the top people in the Biden administration, including Biden himself, are Irish. <laughs> and that includes Jake Sullivan and a lot of others. And so, what, and as you know, the, the British government has been toying with undoing some of the, the protocols for Northern Ireland that were agreed with the EU. And the Biden team is saying, if you do that, no trade deal. And so that's holding that up. So the, Brit the, the Brits are between two stools right now. They really, and the other thing that's hurting them is, um, you know, what, one reason that they went to Brexit was because of immigration and EU immigration. It was the, all the polls, it, it was basically the, the immigration from Eastern Europe that was the issue, not so much from the rest of the world. Um, and so with Brexit, they've lost all these EU workers who went home. They don't have truck drivers. They don't have, you know, basic, um, you know, basic positions are not filled because those workers are no longer in Britain. By the way, The Economist had an article just this week about how Minnesota has the lowest unemployment in the country. And within Minnesota, maybe the lowest in the whole U.S. is Northfield, Minnesota. So they went to Northfield. Um, and nobody's happy in Northfield because nobody can find workers for anything in Northfield. I mean, it's great to have low unemployment, but if you can't, if you have to close your shop or, you know, reduce your hours, because of lack of workers. So the Brits have that like times 10 uh, because of the, the way Brexit has worked out. So I, I don't think they're gonna redo Brexit, but they might renegotiate some things with the EU. Uh, uh, there's the beginning of some talk about doing that. So yeah, it's, um, you know, President Biden, or uh, President Obama went to Britain like two weeks before the Brexit vote. and gave a big high profile speech warning them saying, look, if you do this, we're not going to bail you out. You're going to become a truncated little island in the Atlantic. You're going to lose Ireland. You're going to lose Scotland. You're just going to be, I mean, um, and some people think that that actually helped the Leave group because it was a little too heavy handed. But Obama kind of warned them about what's coming because, you know, Scotland wants to leave. They're probably going to try to have a referendum. Ireland, I mean, yeah, so. Uh, I was at a conference at the London School of Economics, this was a couple of years ago, and one of the economists there said, look, the one, only thing you need to understand about the English, not the Brits, but the English, is that the English want to be Singapore. They want to be a lightly regulated city-state off of Eurasia. It was all about London, it's all about finance, to heck with the rest of the British Isles. And when you talk to some English officials, that's kind of the way they sound, actually. Anyway, it was a big mistake, that's for sure. So, any last questions? Well, thanks everybody for your attention. Thank um, you, Tom. And uh, see you next year, I hope. <laughs>